What is crackling, everybody? Welcome on into the Heat Jack Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and numberfire.com, where today we are breaking down the DFS implications of the 2020 NFL draft and what it means for your early season lineups. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com, joined here as always by Brandon Gadula. He is the managing editor for Number Fire Brandon. We spoke for roughly nine to ten hours Thursday and Friday, breaking down the draft. Back here again to talk about it from a DFS perspective. How you doing? Uh, good. I'm still a little fried. I don't do a whole lot of talking. I don't do a whole lot of socializing. So that was like, <laughs> that was like going to like ten parties, uh, like a, a party every night or something for like two weeks. It it was. It was a lot. I had to be like checked in. Usually yeah. my my men, my go-to state is to like check out of conversations until it's and I can only imagine for you trying to host it. Uh, no, it's the exact same thing forward. because like I check out of literally everything. Um <laughs> like when I'm talking to myself, like if I'm recording the solo shot, I have no idea what I say because it's just like I zone yeah. out like you oh, black yeah. out effectively. And I had to like pay attention at least partway to what you guys were saying for the whole time. And like, that's no disrespect to you and JJ. Oh yeah. Obviously I mean, you guys have, you. we know that we awesome. don't listen to each other. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I've never listened to you. I, are you talking right now? I can't confirm, <laughs> but like, it's just like so weird for me to like, listen, <laughs> I know that sounds so stupid to everyone out there, but like you literally do just kind of like black out at certain points. And it's not because of like, you just kind of like, eh, blah, 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 and you just kind of forget that things are going on. I'm sure that made total and, and complete sense. I don't know. I mean, it makes sense to me. Maybe, maybe not everyone is like us, but it was tough because I mean, I'm thinking like trying to look ahead to like who's picking. You're asking me questions about something that already happened. So I'm like, and obviously, we're not the you know we're just not the kind of podcast or live stream or whatever where we're just spitting like takes we oh, want to have something uh, relevant <laughs> you know i'm just trying to like you know make sure that my market shares are adding up to 100 and so that you know whenever you ask me about the eagles market shares i can say here's what i have but you know it was, it was hard to balance i'm not i'm not complaining but this is going to be a whole heck of a lot more fun plus yeah, because this is like this is laid back i have no data on my sheet i think i'm just <laughs> going to talk with you because i don't <laughs> like we did enough data. We did enough talking. Yeah. I want to have just a conversation with you effectively about yeah, what we can bit. expect. The good news is this is about DFS, yeah. not Dynasty. Yeah. And I think about I, th I think about things from a DFS standpoint, never yeah. Dynasty. So I'm way more at home uh, for this, this show than I was for the live stream. I sent you a Dynasty offer this morning. I have not heard back definitively one way or another. So we'll, we'll need to circle back to that later on. Maybe this is maybe I can convince <laughs> you one way or another. Me. Yeah, That's we'll figure terrible. this one out. I'll just slowly drop hints throughout that, hey, you should accept this trade. Uh, we're going to start things off here. We're going to go basically by different topics of conversation and discuss the impact of that. We're going to start things off with the running backs, Take a look at some of the, the high-impact wide receivers and then finish up with quarterbacks whose situations changed during the draft. Let's start things off here, though, with the running backs because I think at running back, we'll have a better idea about what role each player will play as the season gets here. Because you can look at things like snap rate with the starters during preseason, et cetera, et cetera, and kind of have an idea of what role each player will play. So things will obviously evolve as we get closer to the year, but... As of right now, which of these rookie backs are you expecting to have the most immediate DFS appeal? Uh, I think the number one, at least from a sense of uh, the change from pre-draft to post-draft, is Keyshawn Vaughn uh, for Tampa Bay. I think that's the, the clear sort of number one option. And especially if you're talking, you know, literal week one. Uh, I have two more guys who I'm, you know, wanted to highlight, but I think as as it stands, Keyshawn Vaughn is the most likely locked in Week One starter. Uh, we like Clyde edwards helaire we like Jonathan Taylor, we like Cam Akers, but Keyshawn Vaughn should be the guy for Tampa Bay, uh, especially just based on what else they have on this depth chart. Uh, Ronald Jones, I know you said you have no data. I have some data, not a ton, but a little bit. So. Uh, He's the 18th last year among 24 qualified backs, so 100 carries. 
uh, in rushing success rate, 21st in rushing net expected points per carry. Uh, so it's it's really more of a landing spot thing for Vaughn than it is necessarily his profile. But I think Vaughn has uh, three three down potential. Had four, 14% of Vanderbilt's catches, which was the second highest rate uh, in this running back class behind only Eno Benjamin, who was up near 20%. But, you know, I think week one, uh, three down potential for Keyshawn Vaughn and what should be a good offense. Yeah, I think that he fits really well with what we look for. Because if you are a regular heat check listener, you know we really value passing down backs. We want guys, and not just passing down backs. That's a bad way to phrase it. We, we value guys who get valuable touches. And in Tampa Bay's offense, you're better able to get valuable touches than you are a lot of other offenses because they don't really have a lot of holds. They got Tristan Wirfs in the first round. I think that improves their offensive line a, a pretty decent amount. You can plug him in at right tackle right away. Tom Brady's there. These high-end receivers are there. And maybe the receivers take away a little bit of target share from Keyshawn Vaughn, but the increase they bring in touchdown expectation because of how much the offense can move more than offsets that. So I think that Keyshawn Vaughn is a pretty good pick here. And I agree with you, you know, we'll talk about some of the other guys too, but the one guy I wanted to highlight was Cam Akers. And it's partly because I think the Rams decision-making here and what they've done recently says what they think about Cam Akers. Because remember, the, the Rams didn't have a first-round pick in this year's draft. They traded that away in the Jalen Ramsey trade, meaning their first pick was 52 overall, and they used that pick on Cam Akers. Last year, when Todd Gurley was there, they wanted to conserve him, but Malcolm Brown and Daryl Henderson kind of sucked, honestly, and didn't let them ease Todd Gurley into a lower-end workload. So I... Thought, I guess, that that they might stick with Brown and Henderson just because they had such little draft capital to spend at running back. But, you know, they, they had the Brandon Cooks trade after that, and that kind of changed things. And they decided to use some of that limited capital on a running back in Cam Akers. And Akers is someone who profiles as a pass-catching back. The question is, will the Rams go back to targeting running backs in the passing game? Because that wasn't really a thing they did last year. But I think that based on their actions, they were displeased with Malcolm Brown and Daryl Henderson. He could move into a pretty legitimate role in what I still view as being a good offense. I could be wrong uh, because I've been wrong about the Rams previously, but I think it's a good it's a good situation for him. So I think that from like a potentially undervalued perspective, Cam Akers is really really interesting. Yeah, and I think for the Rams specifically, uh, they might not be the best offense, but they're not one of these. They're not a bottom dweller. Ag- aggressively bad. Uh, yeah, you know, they're, they're not the Jags. Um, so Sorry, that helps Chris a Conley. lot. Chris D- Don't. I know. <laughs> Sorry. I got I got real worked up on the live stream. Uh, yeah, but as worked up as you get, at least. Yeah, I don't show it outwardly. I don't react a lot, so I feel like. Uh, some just of those trade three. him to, I guess I was trying to think of a place that's just devoid of wide receiver talent, but I feel like every team is now loaded because of the draft. So, yeah, um, we but will yeah. send him to. I'm scrolling here. Um, I was gonna say the Jags. So, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I still think he'll be fine, like yeah. fine enough. But for Cam Akers, um, again, I I like the landing spot. Uh, you know, as an offense, because I believe in the offense enough. And I don't, again, this is not one of those spots where it's like, yeah, there's going to be volume, but it's going, they're not going to score points. They're not going to, I mean, hollow volume. It's almost like Le'Veon Bell. Yeah. For how, however good you think Le'Veon Bell is, you might not think he's good, but all the volume doesn't always lead to anything fruitful uh, for Cam Akers and the Rams. I think that'll be a little bit different. Um, Obviously, they they like you said they felt they had a big need after getting rid of Todd Gurley. Uh, Cam Akers had a top four dominator rating uh, for me um, among this running back class. He was my uh, he's my RB three just based on my draft model uh, when you accounting for his draft equity, which doesn't account for landing spot and immediate opportunity. But long term outlook looks pretty good, but uh, the short term looks good as well. Above average speed score for him. Uh, Daryl Henderson, Malcolm Brown didn't really show enough last year, like you said. So uh, going through and projecting out his year one market shares, I have him 
uh, behind just Keyshawn Vaughn, uh, tied with Jonathan Taylor and kind of expected overall market share, which, mm-hmm. again, we're talking about week one guys. I think Cam Akers uh, definitely deserves to get some attention here. I think that the if we're looking at these rookie backs, the only one, I'm not going to include A.J. Dillon because it's a different subject. But, like, if we look at the top six guys, Clyde Edwards-Elair, DeAndre Swift, Jonathan Taylor, Cam Akers, J.K. Dobbins, and Keyshawn Vaughn, if we look at those six guys, the only one – who I would be like actively very nervous about, uh, like week if we're talking like DFS early season, be J.K. Dobbins because we had a lot of discussions about Mark Ingram on this podcast last year, and Ingram was never really someone we were super excited to use because if they got ahead, they wouldn't use him. He was basically only a factor in closer games, and. Mark Ingram's not going to evaporate with J.K. Dobbins being there. I think there is a very real scenario where Dobbins becomes a 1A, but Ingram will still be involved, and Lamar Jackson can take away some goal line work too with his legs. So I have varying degrees of interest in all those guys, but I think that that Dobbins is the one guy who at least right away, I still like him a lot for like Dynasty Leagues, but I think right away in DFS doesn't really fit what I'm looking for. Anyone else make that list for you? Um, if you're going to go with that perspective, you know, you have to be more clear about what you expect for Clyde Edwards Elaire, uh, because mm-hmm. it's a similar offense or a similar situation where it could be like a one a B type of back uh, early on in a very good prolific offense. Um, but I think the bigger question then would be DeAndre Swift and how you value him relative to carry on Johnson in that split. Um, so I would kind of put, those guys in this in a similar tier, and then I guess also Jonathan Taylor and, yeah. and Marlon Mack. Um, so I don't know. What do you, what do you think about uh, their perspective workloads? So I think that with Clyde edwards Elaire going in the first round, it's kind of a game changer uh, yeah. because that's a lot of draft capital. And again, Andy Reid has never, I don't think, spent a first round pick on a back. That's impactful and. Mm-hmm. He also is, he and Swift are the two locks in this class to get really good passing down work. Now, whether or not the Lions decide to give Swift that type of action is a bigger debate. But, like, you could, in theory, see situations where Damian Williams and Clyde Edwards Elaire are on the field at the exact same time because Elaire can, or Edwards Elaire can split out wide. Damian did at times last year as well. So, and the other thing, too, is you don't need a whole lot of juice in the Chiefs offense to pay off because we were using Damian or at least I was when he was averaging like 12 carries and five targets I don't think it's super unrealistic that Clyde Edwards Elaire could get that early on I agree with you that it's like not as big of a lock as someone like Cam Akers or Keyshawn Vaughn but I could see it happening whereas with J.K. Dobbins I'd be a little bit more reserved so I think that's that's where I'm at with Clyde Edwards Elaire yeah I mean, it makes it makes sense. The it's the pass catching matters a ton for these backs. Uh, it's going to be kind of a, a separator, and we're going to hopefully learn more. One thing you mentioned, I didn't want to ruin the segue, but uh, you know, what, if these guys play with the starters in the preseason, like we don't know what the preseason's going to look like. We That's don't know true. how big that sample is going to be. Um, I'm sure they'll figure it out, but uh, that's going to be a little bit tricky. But yeah, for week one. Uh, I would have put like Edwards Hilaire here, uh, but I would I would feel much more confident week one uh, with with Acres, Keyshawn Vaughn, and uh, even Jonathan Taylor. I think. Yeah. What's Just your because... with Jonathan Taylor early? Because like Marlon Mack is there, and he's he's a fine early down guy, but obviously they use they traded up to get Jonathan Taylor for a reason, and this is like a super smart organization. And I feel like they wouldn't... It's kind of similar to the way I I viewed it with Clyde edwards Lair. Like, I trust this organization, and they still spent a lot of equity on a back. So I feel like Taylor's probably gonna have a very big early early season role. I just feel a bit less certain in that than I do with someone like Cam Akers, I guess. Yeah, uh, Taylor was third for me on this, like, list of week one immediate impact guys, uh, just because we don't know the split that they'll have uh, between uh, Taylor and, and Marlon Mack. The funny thing is that uh, Taylor accounted for 10.6% of Wisconsin's catches last year. Marlon Mack actually had a higher reception rate in his final year at South Florida 
13 and a half percent, but we know that Marlon Mack just hasn't been a pass catcher. And I don't know if it's because he can't or because they just don't use him that way. So I was actually kind of surprised that it was Jonathan Taylor uh, for the Colts just because he kind of comps somewhat similarly to, to Marlon Mack kind of overall. But um, week one, I think Jonathan Taylor is going to be uh, definitely viable. And another thing to keep in, in the back of your minds is depending on what the, the off season looks like, uh, these guys are going to have less time with their teams. I think it's going to be e- a lot easier for running backs to come in and make an immediate contribution. Whereas with receivers, whether they're rookies or receivers joining new teams, there might be a bit of a lull there. So yeah. uh, I think that if you're going to play, if you're like, you know, for whatever reason you have to play a rookie in week one, it's going to be the, a running back over a wide receiver. And I think the running backs were put into really good situations where yeah. you want them to. With Jonathan Taylor's pass catching, I think it's it's a question of, did Marlon Mack not get targets because Frank Reich's offense doesn't target running backs, or was it Jacoby Brissett? And I don't really know because even when Andrew Luck was there, they didn't give it to Mack a lot, but Naheem Hines got work. So will Jonathan Taylor get those Naheem Hines targets, yes or no? That would go a long way towards deciding his value because he'll, he'll have – really efficient rushing down work because he's like a world track a world-class track star who is running behind the best offensive line in football so he's going to be really efficient as a rusher will he get work in the passing game that's the question I still think DeAndre Swift is interesting because again he has a good quarterback competent offensive line just a question of how much work he gets from uh carry on Johnson so although we didn't talk a lot about him I think that it's worth mentioning that I'm still in on DeAndre Swift just maybe you want to be a bit more reserved with him. I'm willing to take more chances on Clyde edwards helaire and Jonathan Taylor because of the offenses they're in than I am on someone like DeAndre Swift. I think that's uh, an important differentiation to make. The sports world continues to be at a standstill, but FanDuel is giving you an opportunity to win from home with their free Props Pick'em Contest. All you have to do is correctly pick five props every day and go at least 25 out of 35 over the course of the week to split the $2,500 weekly payout. Then get back in on the action the next week. It is that easy. Age and location restrictions apply. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited. And for more details, check out the banner in the FanDuel lobby. Let's move now and take a look at some of these wide receivers, starting off with the one I liked personally, the most before the draft, that was CeeDee Lamb. And I liked CeeDee Lamb because he was really fun to watch in college, which is a good, you know, that's basically my scouting process. Was this guy fun? Yes, I like him. That was my scouting process with CeeDee Lamb. He goes to Dallas. Obviously, Brandon, this is good for Dak Prescott. What does it do for you at the pass catchers? Uh, Yeah, CeeDee Lamb was my number one. Uh, coming into the draft, you know, long term, he'd still be my number one uh, receiver. But for the short term, it sucks. <laughs> like for year one, it's just I mean, and it's not even like terrible uh, because he's going to be at worst their third uh, pass catcher. Uh, he's still projected to have or he, he, he was going to be projected to have like a huge a huge for a rookie target share for me. Sure. I was ready to plug him in for like 19, almost 20%. And, and like a, if you went to an offense where they really needed pass catchers, but like if he had gone to Oakland, I was going to say, if you went yeah. to Oakland, I was like 20% yeah. probably to start and then maybe bump it up from there. Sure. But um, right now uh, I, I don't know what that's going to look like exactly. Now last year for context, Michael Gallup had, and this doesn't adjust for games missed or anything, but Uh, 21% of the team's targets uh, in games that he played, I should say. So just doesn't look at any specific sample if there were relevant injuries here. But Amari Cooper, uh, 21% or 20% of the targets. uh, Gallup, again, 21%. Randall Cobb, 16%. So I think that there are still reasons that, you know, Gallup, Cooper, and now CeeDee Lamb see pretty decent target shares, but just nothing elite. Uh, My initial projections for them right now, uh, 22% for Cooper, 20% for Gallup, 16%. For C.D. Lamb. Uh, so in a situation, I think, like Dallas, it's less about where, like, will there be the targets and more because we're looking at this from a daily fantasy standpoint. It's like, who's the guy this week, yeah. right? And I think that's going to be the biggest 
headache with this team. Uh, obviously, Cooper is going to be uh, near the top. We love Michael Gall- or our pro Michael Gallup podcast for sure. Uh, but it just could be kind of like we could be finding ourselves, you know, pounding our heads <clears throat> on the wall trying to figure out which of the three it is uh, that week. Uh, Lamb himself had a really high A dot, uh, which is he had a top 100 rate uh, among like high volume guys uh, in in college. Uh, Mari Cooper, and Michael Gallup uh, both had like high A dots as well. So for Dak, this should be great. I'm gonna love. I'm gonna I'm gonna use Dak plenty. Oh, I think yeah. the the differentiation is, is like Dak in cash games where you don't necessarily have to hit the right stack, but for tournaments, I just anticipate a lot of frustration. What about you? Just multi-entry. Yeah. <laughs> like, you just multi-entry. And Play the take same stats. lineup and swap yeah. them out. Yeah. Looking back at uh, last year, I did try to like account for games where people were kind of banged up, um, and if you take out the time where Zeke was coming back from that contract holdout. So essentially taking out the first four games and a couple other games throughout. Uh, Cooper was a 23%. Gallup was at 22%. Randall Cobb was a 15%. And Zeke was at 12%. And those are like actually pretty good numbers um, mm-hmm. if you're trying to be optimistic about the Dallas Cowboys offense. The other thing too that I think is really interesting is like, Two years ago, it was September of 2018, Jerry Jones said that he thought the the Cowboys offense resembled the Rams. And it was very stupid at the time because the Rams were one of the best offenses in football at that time. Jerry Goff was a top five passer that year by net expected points. And that was before Amari Cooper was there. Like their number two wideout was Cole Beasley. But they've added Amari Cooper. Now they've added CeeDee Lamb. Dak Prescott has taken advantage of those new weapons and ascended to a new level. And I think that's actually a fair comparison, potentially even better than those like that 2017, 2018 Rams run, because I think Dak's better. I think the wide receivers are better than what the Rams had. So like, I think they're legitimately better. And the Rams offense those years was able to support three legitimate fantasy options with, depending on what year, Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, and then Brandon Cook slash Sammy Watkins weirdly. Um, And Todd Gurley still got some work as a receiver then too. So I think if you are hoping to use the Cowboys in DFS, you're kind of hoping that they go the route of the Rams where they just use that same person. Now that can get really stagnant and it can eventually die out as the Rams found out. But when you've got players as talented as Cooper, Gallup, and Lamb, probably not a bad idea to just keep them on the field and let it rip. So I feel like that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is things are super spread out. That can still be okay um, because the offense will be so efficient and they'll score so many touchdowns. But like you said, it could lead to a headache scenario for tournaments where you guess wrong, nail everything else in your lineup, and you're kind of wondering what if. So hopefully they they wind up being the 2017-2018 Rams. But I understand... I think that it's it's good to have some reservations there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great for Dak. Like that's that's number one. Um, like Dak is, it's Lamar, Lamar, Mahomes, Dak. I feel like are kind of if Dak ran a little bit more, he might be like the QB one. But I think he's in that top tier, right? Yeah, I think it's those three. Uh, yeah. We don't know how, you know. We don't need to get into it, but like <laughs> Lamar might not run as much. He's going to regress a little bit Better. just naturally. Um, but Dak is in such a good spot. So this is probably going to be one of those offenses where the target shares are, are pretty concentrated. And that's that happens in, in certain offenses, right. kind of like the Chargers. We'll talk about them in yeah. a little bit. But uh, the Chargers were basically, you know, when everyone was healthy, Keenan Allen about 25% and then Mike Williams and Hunter Henry, like 18% or so that's a, like, that's realistic. And that's probably what we're going to get here. Uh, but we're not going to see anyone up near 30% and the, the week to week spikes could be pretty volatile, but it'll be worth it. I think to chase uh, this offense. Yeah. We want to chase suboptimal situations when the payoff is huge. The payoff could be huge in an offense this good. Hopefully their defense sucks too, so we can get yeah. some high-scoring games. And like they didn't really do a ton to address defense, so maybe we get that situation. 
Let's just hope it does happen. Uh, let's move here to the guy who is actually the number one wide receiver pick. That's Henry Ruggs going to the Las Vegas Raiders. I didn't flub it this time. Let's boogie. The biggest question that I had from this, Brandon, because it wasn't just Henry Ruggs. It was also Brian Edwards. It was uh, Lynn Bowden Jr., who was apparently going to be a running back for them initially. But the biggest question I had here is, can we now use Derek Carr in DFS, something I can honestly say I don't remember the last time I did? Yeah, I, was, I don't know if I used him last year. Um, there was maybe, a game where maybe he a was week shock in... against the Chiefs, and I don't think I used him there, but that'd be the <clears> one <throat> week where I could maybe have considered it. I was going to say, I think I did sneak him in for like cash games as like a floor play, uh, but there was not a ceiling to Derek Carr last year. He had one game with uh, more than 300 yards, one game with more than two passing touchdowns. I think we'll be more able to use Derek Carr, but... We just talked about stacking being problematic with the Cowboys, but that's more like someone's probably going to have a good game. Which one is it? Did you guess right? With the Raiders, their target shares still project to be pretty bad, like pretty low across the board, uh, and that's problematic. I think you know with Henry Ruggs, the speed there is going to be uh, super important for Derek Carr. It's going to help out a lot. And yeah, we know that Derek Carr doesn't throw the ball down the field a ton. He's got a low A dot. Um, was actually 34th in downfield attempt rate among 42 qualified passers last year, but 13th in adjusted yards per attempt on downfield throws. So it's not like he can't succeed throwing throwing the ball down the field. Uh, so I'm I'm more open to using Derek Carr, but I don't know how I feel about their individual pass catchers. So uh, what do you see there? Yeah, I think that, like, Darren Waller could be okay. Uh, but the problem is, we talked about this in the stream, too. The only weeks where he was really good for fantasy are the weeks where people were hurt. Like, mm -hmm. when Hunter Renfro, like, broke his lung or whatever it was, that's nothing that you can physically do. But, like, whenever his lung exploded because football is a terrible sport. You had like, another good fake injury. Or just, like, a <laughs> exploded lung. What was it? Exploded lung? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Um, yeah, when Hunter Renfro was out, that's when, uh, Darren Waller had a ton of usage or before early in the year before Renfro had a bigger role too. And when Tyra Williams, out, that was when Waller had a lot of usage. I could see his usage being bad. The thing with Henry Ruggs that makes me okay with him is that you don't need as much volume to pay off when you have as much yak ability as Henry Ruggs has. We saw this a lot with the 49ers. And, like, we talk about Ruggs like a deep threat. But, like, when you, like, watching Midal Bama, like, I was trying to watch Tua. And, like, there was a slant against some actually good team where, like, he threw it to Ruggs, like, 10 yards downfield. And Ruggs just, like, whoosh, like put on the Jets and he was gone. And, like, that's kind of what you want is someone who can score in multiple ways. And Henry Ruggs has that. So he doesn't need a ton of volume to be DFS viable, I'm just not sure if he'll get to that threshold even just because his value in football stems a lot more f than just getting the football. I think that one interesting fallout here outside of Derek Carr is the fact that they're calling Lynn Bowden Jr. a running back. And it's not because I think that it will hurt Josh Jacobs on early downs. My hope heading into this year was that Josh Jacobs would get work as a pass catcher more, and it's something that they've said that they want to do. But Lynn Bowden is awesome. He's really fun. And they want to train him as a running back and then allow him to do other stuff after that. That's a little bit concerning for me if we're trying to project Josh Jacobs to get a, a spike in targets. I still think he'll get more this year than he did last year because that shoulder injury seemed to really nag. But it makes me question it more than it should. So I think it's arrows up for Derek Carr a bit. And then potentially... Muted enthusiasm for Josh Jacobs is the way I'd phrase it. Yeah, uh, I remember last year when we talked about on the podcast that uh, Darren Waller's target share is probably going to go back down when Hunter Renfro came back and someone thought we were crazy. But like, they got really mad about it <laughs> for some reason. Yeah, they thought we were really stupid. And, you know, I, I don't, I'm definitely not the smartest guy in the room, but let me pull up that game log. Actually, you you talk, I'll pull this up. But like that, I know was what, what game it was. <laughs> that was what we saw with the Raiders, and the the target shares were just low when they were healthy. And I mean, say what you want, but they got Nelson Aguilar in the mix. They're like, 
we don't know what Tyrell Williams is going to do, but uh, the market shares are going to be pretty dispersed based on what we've seen in the past from them. And I'm actually surprised that you seem to be a little bit high on Henry Ruggs because I've liked some low volume explosive receivers and you don't typically seem to like them as much. So I'm surprised. Can you give me an example? Because I've had, I've had a changing of mind here over the past years. So the, Weirdly, the offense isn't as good, but Terry McLaurin. <laughs> oh, it's because I hated the offense. I know, but... Because, like, he'd get a bunch of air yards, but Dwayne Haskins was chucking it in the seats. So it didn't matter. <laughs> that but, was... like, he could, he could catch a slant and house it. I'm very sure. excited for Terry McLaurin long-term. Sure. Once they draft Trevor Lawrence, sure. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I like Dwayne Haskins. I revoke it. Don't hurt me. <laughs> I found the Darren Waller game. By okay, the way. Uh, it was uh, against the Chargers on December twenty second. That was when Renfro came back from his. I don't know whatever happened to his lung. Literally, something happened to his lung because football is terrible. Um, in that game, Darren Waller lit it up. Four catches, thirty seven yards, no tutties. Uh, that was his second lowest yardage output of the year. So, suck it, Twitter. Um, but I think with like it depend with a guy like Ruggs, if it's gonna be low usage, I want that low usage to come from a good quarterback and Carr had like good efficiency numbers last year. So like I'm more willing to trust him. Yeah. Or, so I think then someone like McLaurin. I'm hoping Also that- it was the McLaurin thing was because they ran an archaic offense that wanted to run the football ninety times and was bad when they did throw. There were That's- more things there. Yeah, yeah. But I I hope you're okay with like these riskier dice roll players because that's gonna make the heat check even even more fun when they're at home in slight dogs i'll have henry ruggs i can guarantee you that hopefully that happens yeah he's i mean he's the only one i'm excited about in this offense now i could see edwards developing a role i could see waller still being like a thing but joke's gonna be on us when hunter renfro still has a 30 percent target share and averages like 50 yards per game <laughs> It's it's possible. Um, I don't. The I guess the only the only thing that's really not possible is the thirty percent because they won't. They'll probably they'll probably cap everyone at like twenty two percent. Of course, that's how it must be. Uh, let's talk here about the Denver Broncos. Got Jerry Judy in the first round, KJ Hamler in the second round, and I want to start things off here the same way we started things off with the Raiders. We talked about Derek Carr there, Drew Locke is far more questionable than Derek Carr because our sample on him is much smaller. But at least in college, he's a lot more willing to just let her rip and degaff and see what happens. I kind of hope we see that Drew Locke again with Judy, Hamler, Sutton, Fant, Okwebunam, everyone there. Are you interested in Drew Locke early in the year? I am, but the more I thought about it, like last year, quarterback pricing was really flat on FanDuel. And I was like, I don't want to be a buzzkill, but if he's like $7,200 and we get some like mid-tier starters or like some, just some better options at like 75, like Phillip Rivers, it's going to be tough to, um, it would get... be tough to go Rivers over Locker with those salaries. <laughs> I agree. I begrudgingly agree. I was just trying to think of who might be. No, that's, around that's there, but... a very fair comp. And I, uh, but yeah, right. I mean, in a vacuum, yeah, like Drew Locke arrows up, makes a ton of sense. And uh, for tournaments, we could like getting the ball to these playmakers could just make it super easy for Drew Locke to put up a big game. So I'm I'm definitely very into Locke, but again, being a bit of a wet blanket, like I, I'm not gonna say yeah, we're playing Drew Locke week one, no matter what his price is, because he's probably gonna be priced near. Guys who are, like, a much safer bet. I'd rather you go we're locking in Drew Locke no matter what. (laughs) I used Drew Locke last year, and if I used Drew Locke last year, I got to use Drew Locke this year. I shouldn't admit publicly that I used Drew Locke last year. There's receipts on YouTube. definitely did. Oh, yeah, Yeah. there's uh, somewhere. I don't know. (laughs) Like, some site has, like, scripts that I've run uh, that knows that I used him. They're like, oh, (laughs) we're saving this for a rainy day, bro. Um, But I think that what we look for at quarterback and DFS is upside. And 
Locke's path to upside is a lot easier to see now than it is with some other quarterbacks because they have speed for days between Judy, who ran a 4.45, Hamler, who allegedly would have run like a, I think he said he ran four, a 4.37 while training. 4.27. Four, 4.27? Um, four, they said he would, I thought I read that they thought he would get to a 4.27, but he ran a 4.37. I could be it's, totally off of that. It's possible. Okay, well, he ran a 4.17. Let's just go an extra step here. He ran a 4.17. We can guarantee that. Uh, Fant ran a 4.5. Okwebenam ran a 4.49. Like, last year, I think Drew Locke had 24 pass attempts to guys who ran a 4.5 or better, and now he may have, like, none outside of the ones that go to Cortland Sutton, who ran, a, I think, a 4.5, 4.54. Um and, like, that gives you the ability to score points in bunches. But also, like, Drew Locke is, um, he's not known as being a good athlete, but he is. Um, he actually had a the similar, I think he had a better 40-yard dash than Justin Herbert. And, like, the justifications you hear for the Chargers drafting Justin Herbert were, well, he's athletic. Uh, it was one one-hundredth of a second slower than Justin Herbert at 4.69. Uh, but... He ran a bit in college, didn't run a ton last year, but when you think about speed stretching the field, that also opens things up a bit more for Drew Locke to run. So I'm not expecting Drew Locke to run more, but I could see it happening, and I am okay buying into this is within his range of outcomes early in the year before we allow others to react to it. So personally, I'm not saying lock in Drew, Lo Drew Locke in week one, but I will be inclined, like if it's a decent matchup, I'm going to have speculative shares in multi-entry tournaments. Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. Um, week one, I think, is going to be very interesting. Again, it might turn out that we have like a very similar offseason to what we typically have, but if not, it's going to be uh, way easier to sell myself on, like, why not Drew Locke in week sure. one if everyone else is kind of not quite – uh, up to speed as, as they typically are, but uh, we want to be out ahead of the curve. And I think Drew Locke and the the Broncos are going to be one of those spots where I feel like this just feels like a, a an offense that we're going to talk about once every three weeks in the trend section. Like here's how the target share is going lately uh, because yeah. of, you know, one thing or the other, but uh, Drew Locke. Well, talk to me about the I'm target I'm excited shares. for you. Well, talk to me What's about, up? yeah. Drew Lock is my guy. If you like read my stuff last year, which I'm sorry if you did, uh, but like I loved Drew Lock coming out. Um, I thought that he was underrated because he played a really tough schedule. Um, he was like we always talk bad to speak ill of players with big arms, but he was actually efficient at times at Mizzou despite having like that negative connotation of big arm athletic. Um, so I think that he can hit the upside here. I'm wary of second round pick quarterbacks and being too jazzed about them ever, which is, which is why I make sure to always qualify things with like, he could suck. Uh, but I think the odds he sucks are lower given the people around him. Let's talk about this target shares though, because Cortland Sutton is amazing. We love Cortland Sutton, but they did have, they did add relevant pass catchers, which is something that they didn't have after the Manny Sanders trade last year. So What's the outlook for you with Cortland Sutton now that they have Judy and Hamler in town? Yeah, so I actually did go back, uh, kind of filter out the the you know their shares with Emmanuel Sanders. Um, he made a face. I don't know if I said something. I realized dumb. I deleted all the Chiefs targets from week one through nine from my sheet, and I just saw this now. That's why I cringed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to go back and re-add those after this. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, so I have Sutton with a 27% target share after the Sanders trade. Uh, nobody else above 16.1%, and that was Noah Fant. Uh, but Tim Patrick and Deshaun Hamilton were right around 14 or 15%. So I think Jerry Judy and, and KJ Hamler will just kind of replace Tim Patrick and Deshaun Hamilton rather than eat significantly into Corlin Sutton. I'm not projecting Sutton for 27% uh, of the targets or anything, but... I think that there's a very clear spot, like an identification spot where where the target's coming from. Like, who's losing targets? It's going to be Tim Patrick and Deshaun Hamilton. Um, 
I don't think Hamler really projects for like a super high target share anyway, uh, just because of what he does. So there's room for Judy to have like a decent target share. And I think uh, at the low end, what I have right now for Sutton is 24% of the targets, uh, which is a three, three percentage point uh, decrease. But the offense should be way more efficient. And we talked about this on the live stream. But the stuff that Cortland Sutton had to do to like <laughs> catch passes was insane. Yeah, he, he would like swallow up defenders. So he should have a, a lot you know, a, a lot easier time this year. So I have Sutton for 24%. Um, I have Jerry Judy at 17%, Hamler at 13%, Noah Fan at 16%. And I think, like, there's still plenty of reasons to think that Cortland Sutton can be, you know, toward the top end of the, of the you know, wide receiver ranks and target share. And I think that you can look at this the, the, the opposite of what you did, too, where you can look at what Sutton did with Emmanuel Sanders there, because it was a legitimate second piece, and Jerry Judy, as a rookie, is probably going to be a legitimate second piece. But even when Manny was there for the first seven weeks, Sutton had 25% of the overall targets, but 43% of the deep targets. And that's that's a DFS, like, a very DFS relevant wide receiver. Like, an expensive, relevant DFS wide receiver. And especially if Hamler can stretch the field and alleviate some coverage on Sutton, that could make things even better. So I agree with you that Cortland Sutton is still going to get a lot of targets and be super relevant in this offense. And like no offense number that you said, 16% is not bad for a, a tight end either. So I honestly think this is a going to be a fun DFS offense because we can use Sutton or we can fill tight end with Fant and maybe we get guys like Judy and Hamler to be relevant too. So... I mean, Judy more so than Hamler. Uh, but, like, I think I'm pretty optimistic here. Um, I'm not as optimistic as I was with the Cowboys. Um, right. And, like, they were more so a concern because, like, they had three dudes who would command targets, whereas here it's more like two. Um, if we go Sutton and Judy, and then kind of everyone else is, like, filtering in. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that even while acknowledging they're not going to be the Cowboys from an efficiency perspective. I still think this will be a good offense for DFS. Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, quite fun. And you mentioned like the, the 25 ish percent target share that would have been like 10th among yeah. receivers. Like that's, it's weird. Cause when I first learned market shares, I was like 30, like 28, 30, like 30% 30 yeah. or bust for these top end guys. But well, at the they, time it was, it's just not as much, not as relevant anymore. There aren't as many receivers who get that. Just three last year, top 30%. Yeah. Do you know who they are? Uh, Hopkins, Thomas, actually Hopkins is a 29% Fuller was out. I think he's like 33 when Fuller was in. So I think Hopkins, Michael Thomas, and now they're above 30%. It's really obvious. I guarantee it. I mean, cool. it's not. Julio is like 15%, so it's not Julio. <laughs> I have him at 25%. This is from fantasyadhd.com. Okay. Um, well, this is going to bother me so much. Did you want me to tell you? No, 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 no. Don't tell me. Okay. Gosh, how dare you. Um, Edelman? No, he was at 26. What other players are in football even? Oh, oh in games they played? Yeah, it's not. It's, oh, so it's Devonte. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he missed time, so I was factoring him out, but that makes sense. Okay. So Devonte. I, I never already got it. So. All right. Um, I, I don't. I forget all this stuff unless yeah. I'm looking. At it. I think that the Broncos will be fun. I think that applies to everyone here. Um, I wouldn't expect usage out of Hamler early, especially. Uh, but like, he returned kicks, he returned punts. Maybe you get that double dip with like the defense special teams. We can go that way. Uh, Melvin could be fun depending on how many targets he gets. I think all around this will be a good team. Let's talk about another team that added a lot of speed in the draft. That's the Philadelphia Eagles because last year they didn't have any speed. Uh, they were they were weird. Uh, they got a lot of speed this time though. Jalen Rager in the first round. They traded for Marquise Goodwin. Carson Wentz was someone I don't. Again, I don't. I wasn't super enthused to use last year, but is he going to be someone you use in DFS now that they actually have some, you know, legit options? I thought you were going to say you weren't super enthused about Carson Wentz coming. We don't out. discuss those takes publicly, Brandon. 
<laughs> Those are slack takes. Hey, man, you, you're the one who does quarterback uh, write-ups. I know. At least, maybe. like, people forget that I like J.J. Ortega-Whiteside. Yeah. Uh, so Maybe people forget that I like Brad Kaya. I know. I will never forget. <laughs> Did he get a job in the XFL, man? It's disappointing. Disappointing all around. Yeah, so, so for Wentz... He was pretty average last year in terms of efficiency. The Eagles were like the most league average team that there was <laughs> based on everything. Um, you know, he, so they lacked speed with Deshaun Jackson hurt. He had, I think, 10 targets in week one. Um, it was pretty It was pretty nuts. But uh, in the end, Carson Wentz was 30th in downfield attempt rate. Wasn't very efficient on those passes. Uh, so, that, like... The speed's gonna help, but for Wentz, yeah, I'm 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 higher on Wentz, but I'm just I can't really. It's almost like the Derek Carr situation where I don't necessarily know if I love the target shares or expected target shares and like single game targets because the the Eagles will just kind of give it to whoever's open, and that's fine for Carson Wentz, but it's not fun for DFS. Yeah, I think that with Carson Wentz specifically, last year the numbers were bad, and you could chalk that up to the skill position guys, and you should, because like situation matters so much for quarterbacks, but he also had a ridiculously easy schedule. It was the third easiest schedule if you look at average dropback, um, the average ranking of the opposing pass defense for a dropback. I don't know the way to phrase that. His average drop back came against the 19.3 ranked defense. Let's say it that way, based on number of fires metrics. That was third easiest behind Drew Locke in a small sample and Sam Darnold. We can have a different discussion about Sam Darnold, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a red flag. Uh, but Carson Wentz had the easy schedule and couldn't really exploit it. So that kind of offsets to me the bad pass catcher argument. It doesn't offset it completely, but it, it lowers the weight that that carries for me. So I'm still a bit nervous, I guess, about this situation with Carson Wentz. And, like, I also don't value Marquise Goodwin all that much. Like, he's been hurt a ton. Even when he's played, like, he's fine. I think Jalen Rager's a very good player. I like that addition. I might have gone with Justin Jefferson over Jalen Rager, but I think Jalen Rager is an addition to this offense. I think the biggest winner is actually Miles Sanders here because they didn't take a running back. And he was really good when he got usage last year. We know the team values him because it's kind of like we talked about before with smart organizations spending on, uh, you know, a high value pick on a running back. They did that with Miles Sanders last year. I think that Boston Scott's still going to contribute. But like, I think that Sanders is going to be pretty sweet. So I would say the big winner is Miles Sanders. But, and I think that Wentz gets a slight bump up, but I'm not sure if it's enough for me to like, try to actively buy low there yeah i mean these numbers are never gonna be a hundred percent you can't account for everything in like in yeah in the data even though we have all this data you can't account for everything but i was curious because you mentioned that it might not be just because of the pass catchers but uh sports info solutions has data on like catchable target numbers and on target numbers <laughs> Wentz was fine among guys with 100 or more pass attempts. Uh, They don't have ranks specifically, unless I pour it all into Excel. But he was like just above average in catchable target rate, but it was actually below Daniel Jones, which was funny. Um, I was not big into Carson's once coming out. I can guarantee you I was higher on him than Daniel Jones, though. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I mean, it's very close, but uh, it was just kind of funny that yeah. even with like not the toughest schedule, the catchable target numbers, not anything to be overly excited about, uh, the on-target numbers, nothing great. So I think you and I are both just lower on Carson Wentz than probably a lot of people, and that's fine. I'm willing to miss out, but yeah, um, <clears throat> I- I'm extra willing to miss out if they happen to like share the ball like they did last year Yeah, because, you know, I made this note last year. They had 10 games where a receiver or tight end had at least 15 Fanduel points and it doesn't account for price, but like 
if you're not score if you can't score 15 FanDuel points, I don't really have a whole lot of interest. So 10 of those over the 16 games, one was from Deshaun Jackson in week one, two for were from Nelson Aguilar the next two weeks. <laughs> uh, Zach Ertz had three of them. Okay. Alshon Jeffrey had two. And then there was one from Greg Ward and Dallas Goddard. So Greg Ward got 15 points? In week 15. It was like 15.6 when I looked. That was the week we had the bet on him, wasn't it? I think we had a bet on Greg Ward. Oh, yeah. Ha, ha, ha. Now you forget. Ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, this is never the perfect example. But if you compare that to a team like Tampa Bay last year where they really fixated on a few right. guys, they had 11 games with 15 or more Fandle points. Five from Chris Godwin, four from Mike Evans, then two from Brashad Perriman. Like Perriman was really only relevant when there were injuries. So, but like you might think, well, there are still big games to be had. And like, yes, there are. There were just almost as many uh, from Philadelphia as there were from Tampa Bay. But it's there. You weren't getting teams 40. Like, teams like this with, with target shares that are much more dispersed, they're so much harder to figure out. And there's so much, the, the probability that you hit on that stack is just so much lower. Yeah, and I think with Zach Ertz, like he's so volume dependent, and he's always gotten volume in the past. But now that they have some other legit guys, assuming Alshon Jeffrey's healthy, like is he going to get enough volume to have a big game? I don't know. Um, so I've I've never been into Ertz unless it's been a drastic situation where they don't have a lot of dudes. I think the one guy who could potentially be worth it is Rager because at TCU, like. You look at his target market share numbers, I think he was above 30% of the targets this past year. He didn't have productivity in those targets because he got a lot of downfield work and you know you can look at the data about how many of those were catchable, et cetera, et cetera. Wentz is going to be more able to hit Jalen Rager downfield than you know TCU was. So I could see him having Deshaun Jackson type weeks, but I'm not thinking I'm going to try to be ahead of it. I think the one guy I'll try to be ahead of on is Miles Sanders and then let the pass catchers work themselves out. If Wentz becomes viable, cool, I'll buy him then. But I'm okay, like you said, kind of being a little bit behind uh, when it comes to that. Let's talk about some rookie quarterbacks here. I think that Joe Burrow is probably the one guy who could start week one. What's your outlook for the Charger, or Bengals, oof, uh, <laughs> for the Bengals uh, with Joe Burrow being there and A.J. Green being back? Um, so it's really hard to project uh, rookie quarterback efficiency um, for someone as touted and as efficient as Joe Burrow. I kind of put him in like the top 80th percentile and like what we've seen from quarterbacks in terms of like yards per attempt and uh, net expected points data, which is kind of how I drive like expected efficiency. But I feel like uh, with that, we're looking at efficiency on par or better than Andy Dalton, who frankly had I don't think is quite as bad as everyone else thinks. Um, he hasn't talked about situation. It's never been super great for Andy Dalton in, in recent years, but obviously Joe Burrow stepping into that situation, which is now pretty good uh, with AJ Green, hopefully healthy because I love AJ Green. Tyler Boyd's made uh, huge strides. Um, and then you kind of throw in like T Higgins and John Ross, John Ross has the same impact, not the same impact, but he's got that like field stretching impact. And you can definitely prove that that helps quarterbacks that helps receivers. It helps with efficiency. So uh, for Burrow, I, I mean, I think that this can be like a league average offense, like a passing offense. And that's fine. It's just going to depend on like how expensive is AJ green? How expensive does he get? How healthy is he? Uh, what does that do to Tyler Boyd? So it's this is really, really hard to figure out. Even though I know what I kind of project for this offense, I don't know. Like, I have I don't really have a good barometer for how these guys yeah. are going to be priced. Yeah, I think that my, like, with Burrow, my assumption going into the draft was that the Bengals would do something with their offensive line. I love that they're getting Jonah Williams back. He should be an improvement to left tackle. But they've got a lot of issues elsewhere, and they did not address it until the sixth round. So, like, the T. Higgins pick, if they had taken, like, Ezra Cleveland or Josh Jones or someone there, I mean, I know Josh Jones didn't go to the third, but, like, if they had taken Ezra Cleveland and plugged him in at right tackle, I'd be into Burrow himself. I think that with the offensive line, Burrow is one of the players who can excel uh, 
or do well behind a bad offensive line. Again, my comp this entire time frame has been Russell Wilson because, like, I think he can be good despite a bad offensive line because he's so good outside of structure. But what that will do is it will lower his efficiency to have a bad offensive line, which hurts him in DFS. It's And it's also going to increase the appeal of opposing defenses in DFS. Burrow sneakily held on to the ball a long time at LSU. Uh, his sack rate among the top quarterbacks in this class was second highest behind Jalen Hurts, who had by far the highest time to throw in the entire nation last year, according to Pro Football Focus. He kind of took a lot of sacks because he has like that Russell Wilson mentality where he wants to make a big play, which can be good, but it can also be good for opposing defense and special teams. And I think that's something interesting that I would take away from here is that Burrow may be a little bit prone to sacks and the offensive line's going to suck. So I'm interested in buying into opposing defense and special teams. Now, I will still use the wide receivers because they could go nuts if Burrow performs well, but I think that that's at least an interesting part there um, and, that I want to mention. Yeah, and it, you don't build out projections, I don't think, but um, the most important part of building out projections to me is just identifying target shares and seeing where things can go. And, you know, we don't have to play Joe Burrow to play A.J. Green right. or Tyler Boyd. And really, if you go through their offense, it's very easy to put you know, both of those two, again, we just have to assume that AJ Green's healthy and ready to go. Uh, but for like 22 to 25% of the targets, like they can each get there. That's not unrealistic. And then like John Ross is not going to have, he's not going to get more targets than these two guys. Um, and they don't really have a ton else. T Higgins, I, T Higgins is one of my favorite receivers in this draft class, but he's not going to, you know, compete week one or like the right. first few weeks with these guys. So AJ Green, Tyler Boyd have pretty high target floors here. Apparently T Higgins might start. And I was kind of curious where um, that was the report this morning. I have no hmm. idea for whom, because if they take Ross off the field, I would be like, I think alluding to what you were talking about, I'd be a little bit concerned about the speed element. Cause like that offense took a step back last year after he got hurt. Uh, but yeah, hopefully we'll know run more. four wide. Yeah. Why not? I mean, they don't have a tight end. Really? So, actually, yeah, let's do it. Put Spread it out. Get, who cares? Get Joe Burrow rocking and rolling. Yeah. Uh, Put Andy Dalton tight end. Who cares? I mean, when I used to play Madden as a kid, I would play with the Bengals. Uh, Why? Chad, Chad Johnson. Okay. TJ Hushmanzada. Okay. Uh, whoever their Corey running back Dillon? was. Was he still there? Might have been Corey Dillon. Okay. Uh, but oh, I, uh, I, Ben Jarvis Green Ellis, maybe? No, it was mm. before that. I'm talking like Madden 2005, but I, I would Corey run. Dillon was there anymore. Yeah, I'd run. Know. I'd run four wide. Oh gosh, I I I used to love him in fantasy football too. I'll have to look it up. But um, <clears throat> four wide, and then if if the defense is running, um, if they're running dime, just yeah, audible to a, a quick run. If they're in anything else, just throw is that it. like Carson Palmer days? Yeah. Okay, you can't run with him, which stinks. No. But... If you could, it'd be pretty sick. Yeah, I would. I'd be on board of that. So let's get the let's get Zach uh, Zach Taylor Madden. It yeah, will, they can just run. Yeah. I'll, I'll explain my uh, super sophisticated Madden 2005 yeah, offense yeah. that I came up when I was 15. consultant to the Bengals offense. Brandon Gadula says. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Here, here's what I did in Madden 2005, guys. <laughs> Listen to me. I think the Chargers could probably use a consultant because they, for some reason, did not take a left tackle. Uh, but they've got a lot of DFS relevant pieces. Probably going to be Terod Taylor or Justin Herbert at quarterback. I think we can say that pretty definitively now. Are you willing to use guys like Austin Eckler, Keenan Allen, Hunter Henry, knowing the potential limitations of this offense? And to me, that's more focusing on left tackle than Terod Taylor. Um, Wait, did you say... Sorry. Did you say Terod Taylor over Justin Herbert? Potentially. Well, no, like... I, I heard you say kind of cut out a little bit, and then I also didn't listen to you. <laughs> Classic. Call back. Because um, I was looking up this Bengals thing, but Did you find I thought you said back? definitively. Oh, no, um, no, no. I said we don't okay. know definitively who will play a quarterback. Okay. Rudy Johnson. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I love that guy. I forgot about Rudy Johnson. Hopefully he didn't. Hopefully he was good dude. <laughs> We were too naive back in the day to know any better. So yeah, um, so 
I'll put it this way. I used the Chargers a lot last year. But Phillip the, Rivers yeah. was probably better. Was I mean, look, we both liked Phillip Rivers. He was efficient enough, but I used them because the market shares were good and the talent was there. I don't expect the market shares to be significantly different this year, at least not in a worse way. They could probably just get better. Um, in the 12 games with Keenan Allen, Hunter Henry, and Mike Williams, Keenan was at 25% of the targets. Hunter Henry was 18%. Austin Eckler, 177 and then Williams at 16%. Uh, Melvin Gordon was at 13%, so you get rid of that, whether that's however they fill that. But um, this is going to be one of those spots where the efficiency is going to be a little bit worse than it was last year, but the market shares, I, I can't anticipate being significantly worse for all these guys. So... I think I'm going to be high on the Chargers short term because I think I'll know where the targets are going. So that helps me a lot. Yeah. What about you? Um, I'm really worried about the touchdown potential in the offense with the left tackle situation being what it is, and that worries me. But kind of like you said, like you don't need a ton of touchdown equity to be viable if you get good market shares. And I think given the contract they gave Austin Eckler, I'm comfortable projecting him to have like a, you know – let's say 13 carry six target projection per game. I don't know if that's too optimistic on the target side. It might be on the target side. It's probably a little bit too hefty, but like somewhere in that range. And I can use a player in that, even if they're not scoring five tutties a game. So like, I think Eckler's interesting. I am hesitant about the other stuff though, just because like Keenan Allen sometimes has questions about his ceiling. Hunter Henry is a tight end and we're, we want touchdowns out of our tight ends. So I might be a little bit um, off the Chargers to start things off. And if they ha- find a left tackle somewhere, I don't know where, but if they do, like the, the right side of their offensive line is like, cool. They got Trey Turner and Brian Bulaga there. That's awesome. But the left side is, oh my gosh, Tarod, get an insurance policy. Um Write a will? I don't know. Like, it could get really bad. So I'm really worried, and I think that 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 sours me a bit on them. But I think I might just take a a slow play approach with them. I mean, I don't don't think that that will really haunt you, but I would expect with either Terod Taylor or, you know, a rookie at quarterback that the prices would be a little bit down. Fair. And then we're looking at probably one of those spots where – the expected target shares outweigh the the FanDuel salary a little bit. And yeah. then that's one of those spots where it's like, I'm looking for a wide receiver at like whatever the price, then that makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. I think that's fair as well. Uh, how are you viewing the Dolphins offense? They added to the offensive line. Seems like Ryan Fitzpatrick probably going to start over to a tongue of Iloa, at least initially. Do they get Preston Williams back? Certainly interesting. They have Matt Breida and Jordan Howard. Vomit. Uh, what are you thinking about them early on? Uh, so last year with Williams healthy, he was at like 22% of the targets. Uh, Devontae Parker at 18%. Uh, and then third in that span was Kenyon Drake at 15.5%. So it's probably safe to say that Preston Williams and Devontae Parker stepping into very high like high floor uh, target share projections uh, for Miami. The efficiency might not be what it would be in other offenses, but I think we're both probably okay with Ryan Fitzpatrick, especially from a fantasy standpoint. Um, So my like initial reaction here is I think Preston Williams and Devontae Parker are going to be those types of plays who are relatively cheap, who can get like, eight to 10 targets because that's just what's expected to be there. And we're like in a cash game. Yeah. The, the targets are there. The price isn't too high because it's the offense that they're in. And I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of those, those weeks this year. And I think that Mike is could be in a similar range too, where he's like at least viable. And I think that this offense will be good enough uh, because Fitzpatrick is competent um, they added to the offensive line. Uh, they got uh, Robert Hunt, who could be either right guard or right tackle. Josh Joe or uh, Austin Jackson, they got in the first round as well. They signed Eric Flowers and Ted Karras. So, like, 
they may they will have four different starters along the offensive line than what they had last year. And that was my main concern to them is like I didn't initially expect them to score points. They did later on. But the offensive line is better, so my point projection for them could be better as well, which means I could be into Devontae Parker, Preston Williams, Mike Gesicki, and steadfastly avoid the running backs like the plague or COVID-19. But I think that I can be into them. Um, I would lean Parker probably just because he and Fitzpatrick had such a good rapport down the stretch, and I think that might carry over a bit. Plus, like, I'm always hesitant to buy into a guy off an injury, I guess. Um so I think that that's why I would lean towards Parker, but I think that all three of those guys are totally fine. Yeah, I had uh, so much Preston Williams in best ball yeah. last year. Oh, rest in peace. <laughs> it had started off well. Yeah, um, it certainly did. But yeah, I think both of those guys and Gesicki do it to a certain degree, especially at tight end because we can we right. don't really spend up at tight end often on this podcast. So, but yeah, with the running backs, I don't see a ton there. We don't know what the the split's going to be I just have to I just cut Kalen Balazs from my one of my dynasty teams so poor I'm... one out man <laughs> probably gonna have to drop Laird at some point too so we're uh we're living in the same zone maybe I should I don't know um let's talk with the Packers here because they're wild um <laughs> let's talk about the overall offensive efficiency first because they didn't do a ton to address short-term offensive efficiency they did let their right tackle go in Brian Bulaga that will change their offensive efficiency, which is not in a good way. Uh, they did sign Devin Funches. Cool. Um, but they struggled with efficiency last year. And this offense isn't all that different. So can we trust Aaron Rodgers now that they've ignored improving the skill guys around him? No. How many times did we play Aaron Rodgers last year? I tried to once, but he was down to like... Geronimo out. No, Geronimo Allison was out. No, Geronimo Allison was supposed to be out against the Raiders. And I was like, oh, I want to use Rodgers, but everyone's hurt, so I won't use him. It's like Jake Kumaro is the top receiver. And then Lazard and maybe MVS or whatever it was, like, played despite being questionable or, like, missing practice the entire week. And I missed the boat, and he went nuts. And then I couldn't ever buy back in after that, except for, like, single game against the Chiefs. I think I might have – I think I did a trend – on Rodgers that week. You did. And I still didn't use enough of like that was his Well, cuz like we didn't know the injury situation at yeah. the time and like we missed the boat because of the freaking injuries. Yeah, so Rodgers no, can't trust them. Um he had 10 games with fewer than 15 Fanduel points last year. Only four with more than 20. Only one was like more than 28. That was the the Raiders game. There's just it's really difficult and I mean, I don't want to make that sound like this is what he did last year. So right, right, right. Uh, but what's different than last year, really? Yeah, and like we're a pro Rogers podcast, but the problem is you can't expect him to put up a ton of DFS points when he's throwing to Devontae and a bunch of UDFAs. Like that's not realistic, and it's not fair to him to put those expectations on him. Yeah, you can only do like you can only do so much, and. Look, they can win. They were a good team overall last year, but we want fantasy points. I don't care if your team wins. Like, I just don't, I don't care. No. I want you to throw that seventh touchdown and lose. Like, I'm yeah. fine with it. Um, Which yeah, they did I mean, against the 49ers in the championship game, and they got Aaron Jones a touchdown late, and I'm still grateful for that. But... <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Rodgers is probably the biggest loser... From what could have been? Correct. From expectation. From, yeah. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Um, Aaron Jones is kind of like in that same realm because they took A.J. Dillon in the second round. Uh, Aaron Jones was kind of due for touchdown regression to begin with, and now they add A.J. Dillon, who is 247, might want to use that guy towards the goal line. Are we just going to fade Aaron Jones until indefinitely, basically? I mean, if anyone's new listening to this, I don't. I never really loved Aaron Jones. I think he's a good talent, but the way that they used him was always a little bit problematic. Without like a surefire role at the goal line, just soaking up the touchdowns, it's going to be really hard for me to want to play Aaron Jones a ton. So I don't think the seal. The reason that I would play Aaron Jones, I would 
I would never want to play him. And then Jim and JJ, uh, Zachary <laughs> would talk me into like Aaron Jones from an upside standpoint each week. And then week. he'd go off for 40 points. You're welcome. And he'd go off for, and I'm like, fine. <laughs> and then the next week I'm like, yeah, but here's all these, here are all these reasons why I don't want to play him. And then, but like when the touchdowns weren't there and you can do this for any, any running back, but if the touchdowns aren't going to be there necessarily, I don't really want to use Aaron Jones. Right. And like, the reason I was willing to buy into Aaron Jones is because I expected the touchdowns to be there. This year, I don't as much because, like, again, they did not improve their offense. They got worse by losing Brian Bulaga. And, again, it's not to me a terrible right tackle because I have some guys uh, between Ricky Wagner and Billy Turner who could fill right tackle. But, like, it's not going to be as good. So, like, that hurts. The one way in which I could still get really excited is if they, like, say, deuces Jamal Williams and – decide to use Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon together. Like if they split Aaron Jones out wide to make up for the fact that they ignored wide receiver, something they did do at times last year, then we can boogie, but I'm not going to assume that that's not going to be my baseline assumption because I don't, I give a lot of teams the benefit of the doubt. I'm not going to give the Packers the benefit of the doubt right now, uh, based on what has happened. So if I see that happen, I'll buy in but I want to see it first, I guess is where I'm at. Yeah. That, that was the only note that I really had. Um, maybe like, maybe it's Jamal or it should be Jamal Williams. Who's right. like the biggest loser. So I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like it's going to be AJ Dillon and Jamal Williams, but we don't want to play running backs in timeshares because the whole, I mean, one of the whole points of DFS is that you don't have to do that in like season long. Sure. If you have Aaron Jones on your team, if you have him on your dynasty teams, it's not like this is the end in 2020 for him. But in DFS, you don't want you don't want to split backfields. If you want him on your dynasty teams, let me know because I probably have him and I'm probably trying to sell him. Uh, let's close <laughs> up here before we get out for today and talk about some guys who contribute early in the year. Are there any rookies we have not touched on yet, Brandon, who you might be interested in buying into and could have viability for DFS like right away? Um, so people might be hoping like I come with some like super deep cuts, which is always fun, but, uh, deep <laughs> cuts don't really pan out for her. Deep cuts for a reason. Uh, I, I look, I was looking at this just to <clears throat> get a bit of a sanity check. Cause like the fifth plus rounders, I didn't really project for any market shares. I just threw them into the other bucket in my projections. I think like 8% of receivers drafted to the fifth round or later see 50 targets their first year over the past 10 years. Like it's just very rare that uh, players who are not like day, day one, day two picks are relevant. So they're going to be more like these, these early guys, but uh, someone we didn't mention was not in detail, at least Denzel Mims uh, for New York, the jets, I should say, I really loved him coming out. Uh, he, he fell farther than I would have liked, but opportunity is definitely there. I have him for a 16% target share, uh, tying with Henry Ruggs and CeeDee Lamb uh, this year. So I think, like, immediate, he's someone who stands out. Yeah. I am interested in, in basically the second-round receivers. Like, that's the way I'd say it. Denzel Mims is one of those guys. Uh, but Chase Claypool is huge. He is fast. We can kind of make the play the assumption game with Brent, Ben Roethlisberger and hope that he has an early role and like chase claypool has a lot of draft capital tied to him he went before denzel mims uh he went before a lot of guys who were going ahead of chase claypool in like dynasty rookie drafts so i think people might not be in on him and that's kind of the way i want to play it is if i'm gonna go here i want to not do so on guys who are gonna be popular so i think the chase claypool kind of fits that i also think you could say the same thing about van jefferson because no one liked this dude pre-draft i didn't like this dude pre-draft i still am not I don't know what the Rams are doing, but when you look at guys who contribute across the NFL, last year, all of the top nine wide receivers and half PPR scoring were top three round picks. Eight of the top 10 running backs were drafted in the first two rounds. Look at draft capital and guys who may go underappreciated despite having heavy draft capital tied to them are uh, Denzel Mims won't, but I, I still like your pick because I think that he's going to start. Uh, but Van Jefferson... Chase Claypool, I think they're both going to fit into that scenario. KJ Hamler does from a profiling perspective, but 
I agree with what you said about how we should expect Sutton and Judy to have more targets. I think that, that Hamler's more like a guy you target if he slips into the third round of your rookie draft. Uh, but I think that that's kind of where I'm at there. Maybe you go with LaVisca Chenault and hope that the Jaguars get creative with the uses there. And then Michael Pittman. Michael Pittman's not going to fly into the radar. But we use Zach Paschal and some dude who is definitely no longer in the NFL for the Colts last year because they had no one behind T.Y. Hilton. Why would we not use Michael Pittman? So I think just kind of broadly, every receiver who went in the second round has my early interest because draft capital matters so much. Yeah, I have Pittman on my list as well. Um, he's just, it's a good, it's a great situation. Good quarterback. Uh, we always get at least eight games indoors. I mean, you're going to get some chuck and pray. Um, but yeah, I have, him, I have him at like a 15% target share. And these are just initial because he should be the second play uh, behind Hilton, even if he kind of shares with Zach Pascal. But uh, Pittman was someone I highlighted. And then I know you mentioned second round receivers, but I, th- I think that we didn't really talk about Justin Jefferson. Um, clearly, like Minnesota has a plan to use Adam Thielen and Jefferson together. I was a little bit underwhelmed at the landing spot um, on draft night, but you know, the only fear really is that there's like a more of a horizontal offense, but the 22nd pick, there's going to be volume there. So if we're looking for like just someone who we haven't talked about, uh, super, like on this podcast, but could be super relevant, super early. Jefferson definitely is someone we should uh, mention. And the good thing too, is like they did lose their offensive coordinator and Kevin Stefanski, but Gary Kubiak was like kind of co-offensive coordinator. And I would assume he had a big role to play in the, play action and chuck it offense that they ran from like week five on and like that would play well for Jefferson too um so I think that he could be pretty relevant right away he seems polished I have no I'm not a good judge of like receiver talent but like he seemed to be like a pretty safe selection um so I, I would agree with Jefferson too um as someone being that we'd be interested in pretty early on but I think Honestly, just putting value in draft stock and draft capital and trying to find guys who may have roles right away, that's how you can find your Terry McLaurin type guys who broke out early on last year. Pay attention to the preseason if we have it to um, and try to connect those dots. Any final things you want to say before we close up shop, Brandon? I think just draft capital is super, super important. We just started hammering it at like the very end of this show. But yeah. again... Teams can draft anyone they want if they don't draft a guy till the sixth round. It's for a reason, most likely. So uh, keep that in mind if you're ever trying to break ties early on with these rookies. And if you need to emotionally break ties with a quarterback you may have loved too much in the pre-draft process and went in the fifth round, it's a pretty easy way to justify doing so. So yes, I'd agree with that as well. Uh, Brandon, people have questions for you on Twitter. Where can they find you there? I'm at Gadula13, G-D-U-L-A-1-3. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Given the weird sports calendar right now, probably not going to have regular podcasts here in the Heat Check feed, but we're going to really pop in. Um, NASCAR podcast may be back not that far down the road. Uh, PGA, PGA potentially coming back in June, too, so... We'll be back eventually, so make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, the Google Play Store, you name it, we are there. You can subscribe and get every podcast right as it is posted. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always, and thank you to everyone for tuning in both today and and for our live streams during the NFL Draft, hopefully you learned something, hopefully you had a good time, and hopefully we can start this year's DFS season off on the right foot. This has been the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire. <laughs>